brainstorm. Today's episode of Killer Means Awesome is brought to you by Jade Petrochemicals. With offices in Long Beach and Bahrain, Jade Petrochemicals sets the global standard for safe storage and shipping of vital petrochemicals. That sounds like a wild party that's going on there. Yeah. You know, like the the glass is breaking and it just, it it sounds like a good party. It's experimenting. Yeah. There's a lot of uh, inventing going on in the background. Uh, Dr. Geller, welcome back. It's episode two of Killer Means Awesome season three. Correct. Very exciting. Again, the new Halo brand, Killer Means Awesome, uh, this season featuring inventions, killer inventions. Um, and uh, yeah, super excited for episode two. Yeah, couldn't be more excited. Can you bring us up to date on some of the far-flung places people are listening to us from? Absolutely. So we're going to check in, uh, say hello to a, f- a few of the places where people were listening uh, from in the last episode. And yeah. so to start, let's say hello to our friends in Warner Robins, Georgia. Warner Robins. Oh, yeah, they got some great cool. place names down there. Before it was like Peach Tree Corner. Yes, and now we got Warner Robins. We do well in Georgia. It sounds like yeah, both with Peach Tree Corners and now Warner Robins. Uh, we seem to be taking over Georgia and Canada. We always do well in Canada and Georgia. Perfect lead in to our next hello, which goes out to Edmonton, Alberta. Oh, listeners man. in Edmonton, the Oilers, way up there. Go Oilers! Um, except Exciting. don't. Yeah, what what is it? We, we, like neither one of us is Canadian. Why do we no. do so well up there? You know, it might be proximity. Like they just kind of hear us over the border, and so they check us out. Uh, I mean, really you're from Chicago. Sure. That's like almost Correct. Canada. Uh, not really. Across the lake, right? Well, technically, you cross the lake, then you're in the UP, and then you can continue on. Uh, to Canada. Yeah, I'm thinking of Detroit. Yeah, Detroit's you're not pretty from close. Detroit. Yeah, I'm not. Um, but let's also say hello to our friends in Spring City, Pennsylvania. So no we got way. Georgia, Pennsylvania, and Alberta this week. I wonder where. I wonder where in um, the Keystone State. Uh, what's where? where what, what's Spring it City? Again? Spring it's City. I wonder where yeah, that Spring is. City. I don't know. It sounds nice. It sounds lively. Yeah. Yeah. My my uh, mom. First few years of her life, she was in Wilkes-Barre. Oh, where's that? Pennsylvania. I don't know. It's like, no, no, I mean, but this is that Western. I think it's Western, Western PA. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, I say that, but I think it's near Scranton. So ah. I should know this. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, no, were you able to look at the inbox? Any, any excitement <laughs> was, over the first I episode? was it, it, um, excitement. Yeah, I, yeah. Mark M from Newton, Mass asked if there were more books that we could recommend uh, on the topic of psychedelics. Interesting. He wants to read rather than experiment. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, you know, I uh, don't want to encourage people to no. uh, use these substances necessarily unless they're over 18 and in a locality where they're um, at least decriminalized. That being said, there's a good one by a guy named James Fadiman, F-A-D-I-M-A-N, I think, mm-hmm. that gives you the basics on the topic. Is he pro? Is he a, a pro psychedelics? Uh, he's both a professional and he's okay. uh, in favor of. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. That sounds good. He's experienced. Yeah. There's one also called Acid Dreams, which is good. It kind of gives like the, the history of LSD and um, the history of LSD in relation to American political history, American cultural history. Mm-hmm. That's a pretty good one. And then the other one that I think I mentioned in the last episode was the uh, Michael Pollan book, How to Change Your Mind. Yes. So, I mean, yes. I you know, maybe start with those three. And then, of course, um, the other one also mentioned in the in the podcast was the one Albert Hoffman himself wrote about LSD, yes. uh, my, my Problem Child. So, Mark M. in Newton, thanks for listening. And maybe start with those four. I didn't, you know, in the last episode, I was like, oh, and look, Bill Gates did LSD. And oh, look, uh, you know, Steve Jobs did LSD. I didn't mention like, and so did Charles Manson. 
and mm. so did you know Lee Harvey. Yeah. Oz, you know what I mean? It could go Gotta balance way. it out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Exactly. yeah. Uh, unfortunately, the other email we got was from Charlotte in England. That generally is botany is related. We didn't not, mention Queen Anne's lace. Not always a great either. sign. Um, yeah, we love what an avid close listener she is. She Jeez. said that uh, she pointed out an error in last oh. episode. Really, she said that Cary Grant's wife was indeed on the Andrea Doria, yes. and the actress Ruth Roman was on the Andrea Doria ship, mm-hmm. which we covered. Yep. In season one of Killer Shipwrecks. Shipwrecks, yeah, that was a great yeah. shipwreck. Yeah. But those are not the same person. Oh. Ruth really? Roman and, yeah, I. it's obvious now saying it, but in our episode, I think um, you made the great callback. You were like, wait, dude, wasn't it Cary Grant's right. wife? Wasn't she on the ship? And I was like, yeah, Ruth Roman. But those are two different people. Oh, I see. But they okay. were both so- on the ship. Both on the ship, so no harm, no foul. Um, no harm, no foul. Um, unclear. Thank you, they, Charlotte. Yeah. yeah, Charlotte's amazing that way. She sometimes I feel like she's trying out for um, Lizzie's job. Like she's trying to, you know what I mean? Like she's got that sort of like the excellent work, boys. But you know, there was this mistake, and also you know your tone in relation to this subject. You know, she's got a little bit of that yeah. school marm. Right, but maybe she could be a fact checker. I mean, it sounds like maybe if she were to screen our episodes in advance of release, we could uh, be well covered. Um, Any other housekeeping items before we Eh, jump in? You know, some people saying great job, but those were the two that felt like they needed to be addressed. Um, Let's jump in. Yeah. Yeah. Season three, episode two. Now, last week, uh, you kicked off the season with the story of the invention of LSD, um, which centered on the chemist. Albert Hoffman, is that right? That's that my recollection. Is true. That's my recollection as well. So we're uh, we might both be wrong, but at least we're wrong together. Excellent. So now, given that there is going to be some continuity uh, for this continuity. episode, because believe it or not, we're still in the world of chemistry. No. So, but not, maybe this should have been killer chemistry. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe that's maybe that's next season. Killer chemistry. Not a bad idea. Although we will have already used up two great stories. In any case, let's get going. Uh, This person's name that we're going to be discussing today, the inventor's name is Sir William Henry Perkin. Perkin. William William Henry Perkin. No S on the end of that thing? Uh, You know, I I triple checked that because I kept saying his name as Henry Perkins, but it's Perkin. Perkin. Weird. Okay. So Sir William Henry Perkin was born in March of 1838 in London, England. So again... Episode two, we have another European chemist. Keep going. I'm, you've, you've, you have my attention. Right. So 1838, uh, William Henry Perkin is born. And we're going to quickly skip ahead uh, 18 years uh, to 1856. Okay. So we're, we're just cutting to the point where William Henry Perkin is 18 years old. And the year is 1856. Now, 1856, incidentally, was a leap year. No. And oh, I know we track Here those we things. Go. I know yeah, we track those do. things. But what's interesting is guess who invented leap years <laughs> this, I mean, is like no, mini, this is like an episode like a, within an episode yeah exactly uh we're like a chinese <laughs> no we're, we're that russian nesting doll of inventions but <laughs> what um who is it, invented in, leap years well is it that they invented them or they just well, sort kind of, of they came up with them they just said okay. like hey, you know what we're gonna shorten up the year or you know we're gonna do Leap years. <laughs> um, that's a great question. And yeah. uh, I don't know the answer. Well, I'm going to tell it? you then. It is Roman Emperor Julius Caesar. No He's way. He's back. He is back. <laughs> and he created leap years. So that has nothing to do with the episode, but I thought it was a funny little connection to various episodes we've done. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so and, Julius Caesar. Uh, Not I sure what Cleopatra that. thought about the leap year idea, but, you know, he, he introduced it. So it goes back a long ways. You know? um, I should have known that. I'm the supposed resident uh, yeah, ancient you're the priest, Roman, ancient exactly. Rome expert. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. So now Perkin is 18 years old. He is a student uh, at the time at London's Royal College of Chemistry. Cool. So he's studying chemistry. He has not become a chemist, right? He's only 18 in school. During his spring break, so they called it Easter break. Uh oh. Uh, his instructor, August Wilhelm von Hoffmann, again, funny coincidence, his last Seriously? name is Hoffmann, another chemist, yes. Okay. His instructor um, told his students 
over the break, he'd like them to work on a project in their home labs and see if they could figure out a way to produce quinine. Run the experiment mm. and, and see if you could maybe come up with a cheap way to produce quinine. Now, quinine has also come up in other episodes. Yes, yes. That was a, a shipwreck where they were bringing back whatever the um, plant was from the new world that you could get quinine from. That's exactly right. And so the quinine obviously used to treat malaria. But as you reference, at the time, it had to be extracted from the bark of these exotic trees. And it was very expensive to produce. And so he wasn't suggesting for spring break, they fly to South America. No, it's sort of like the opposite of Daytona Beach. Stay home in your lab and come up with a way to uh, to, to create quinine. Okay, hmm. so And again, so times have changed, right? Now, spring break, you think the beach, you think skiing. Back then, it was go home and develop an anti-malaria drug. So everyone, you know, did their own thing. Yeah, that's a more productive use of spring break. Yeah, although I kind of remember once on spring break playing with baking soda and water and creating flubber. You know, that material, like when you squeeze it, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a, a hard substance. And then when you release it, it turns into a liquid, the flubber. Yeah, and I remember one where uh, one of the kids had to do like a science uh, experiment for school. We did the thing where you drop like the Mentos into the huge bottle of Coke and the thing explodes or whatever. Yeah, that's that's awesome. That's an evergreen. That one is always a good – that'll be good 50 years from now. That'll be a good school science project. Absolutely. Unclear if that has any impact on malaria, but definitely a distraction, right? So like if you're suffering from malaria, uh, that would be a fun little burst of energy to see that, uh, that the geyser of diet. It's a geyser. Great word. That's what it is. Yeah. Okay. So now let's get back to this anti-malaria drug. So you might be thinking, oh, how cool. He wanted his kids to contribute something to the world, eradicate malaria. Um, But that wasn't the reason. The reason Hmm was because of Europe's colonial grip potentially slipping because of malaria. So it wasn't necessarily an altruistic pursuit. It was more about like, geez, we're taking over all these lands and all our people are getting sick. So we need quinine so we can keep, you know, plundering. Wow. So you just flipped it on its head there. It became became a tool of empire. True. However, I am unclear as to whether or not William Henry Perkin was aware of any kind of sort of nefarious ideas behind this assignment. Um, yeah, he I think was he was just, just bummed to, that there, no, he was just bummed that there was homework over spring break. Right. He's like, ugh. Right, you said no homework. That's the only reason I signed up for this class. Yeah. Like, what's going on here? Um, however, ever the uh, dutiful student, Perkin began experimenting, uh, and he was using a substance called aniline, uh, which is a colorless aromatic oil derived from coal tar. Really? Yep. And the coal tar was basically described Wait, as... What's the name of that? Anil- uh, aniline? Aniline. A-N is in Nancy. I-L-I-N-E. That's okay. what he was using to do his experiments. Um, now, this was a discarded sludge from the gas lighting of the Victorian period. So it, oh. lots of it laying around most households. Uh, it, was, it was a waste product. So he's going about his business. He's doing his concoction. Can you imagine how bad air quality was back there in London? I mean, that's one of those, it it reminds me of Latimer. It's like, hey, turn on the air conditioning. I can't (laughs) breathe. Yeah, but I'm killed. It's perfect. Yeah, but I can't breathe. Like every single day, air quality index would have been like just horrible. Don't go outside. So he's adding some alcohol, he's mixing things up, and he's trying to get that colorless quinine. He noticed, however, though, in his test tube after mixing it all together, um, that all he had was a thick black goo. And so sort of the opposite of quinine. Yeah. So he's pretty bummed. He's like, whoa, this backfired. Um, So he's trying to wash it off. And as he's washing it off, he notices that the residual effect of this black goo leaves a very vivid purple color. Okay. Really? Yes. On his skin? Or uh, on yes, the equipment. I, I love the way that you're introducing these concepts because it started out on his skin and then he noticed that it transferred to a cloth. And when it transferred to the cloth, it had this untarnished brilliance in color. What? Okay? Yeah. So he's what looking at world? this purple color on the cloth and he realizes that he did not synthesize quinine. Yeah, he's going to get an F. He's not going to do well in this course. Plus, his parents are pissed because he's ruined the tablecloth. Black goo all over the place. But (laughs) he did inadvertently uh, invent the very first synthetic organic chemical dye. No. Trying to do the quinine ends up 
with the first synthetic organic chemical dye. They describe it at the time as one of the most astonishing examples of serendipity in science. And I'm going to explain why. He's sitting there with this purple dye. Now, until that point... He's like, this is a disaster. I cannot (laughs) get this out of this fabric. This is... Purple is so not my color. Like, First of all, it's not my color, although... You know, England is the, uh, Britain is the land of uh, monarchy. So, you mm-hmm. know, maybe they can get a contract with the royal family. Yes. But still, it's like, you know, he's probably thinking like, oh, God, like this is not at all what the assignment was. Correct. Now, at that time, there were only natural dyes. And you referenced the royal. So the natural dyes um, have a very rich and long and, dare I say, colorful history. Uh, yeah. In, in I was going to say India, Armenia, places like that. Yeah. Yeah. So all of these natural dyes obviously derive from plants and animals. And the extraction process. What what, what are they using the animals for? I'm going to tell you. So the extraction process for creating these natural dyes was uh, very painstaking and laborious. Um, So it was very rare for sort of the average person to be able to get their hands on some of these colored uh, objects. In the case of purple in particular, the uh, way in which purple was created, and you referenced the royals, and partly it was because of how rare it was. The reason Uh, being, mm. it had to be extracted from a type of shellfish that only grew in select places in the Mediterranean. Get out of town. I'm not making this That's where purple came from? That's where the the natural dye, yeah. It came from shellfish? Yeah. Get out of town. I don't uh, do that. I don't, uh, I can't leave town. Did you triple, did you triple check all this? No, I double checked. So I'm going to do the other checks. I'm going to leave the rest to Charlotte. So the um, process was very costly. It's very messy with these shellfish. And so just generally deadly uh, and deadly to the shellfish. Unfortunately, they did not survive the, uh, the, the color. So this was all described. uh, Speaking of books, if you're interested in reading more about this, uh, there's a professor of business history at the University of Leeds. Uh, her name is Regina Lee Blazik, and she wrote a book called The Color Revolution, uh, which goes into great detail about how these dyes were created. Now, again, when you talk about purple, we'll get into a little more about how that purple was created, because as I mentioned, it, it was quite the process. And, and and the number of these shells that needed to be, uh, you know, grabbed um, from nature to make the, the the color is astounding. Yeah. How did they even figure that out in the first place? But okay, go ahead. Yeah. Hard to know. So the general problem at the time was also this limited supply of natural resources because mm-hmm. the European imperial powers were going around colonizing the world and plundering these natural resources. Right. And they did so because there was a huge appetite in Europe for these colored fabrics among you know the wealthy particularly the color purple. But colors in general back then were a little bit of a sign of wealth. You know, so it was like, hey, is that Gucci? No, it's purple. So it has the same type of thing going on where people have it as a status. Um, Yeah. It's amazing to put yourself back in that time because we're just so used to the idea of everything being available now. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, I can order a tapestry tomorrow on Amazon or whatever. But back then it was like, oh my God, look at that tapestry. Like you have color. Like, you know, that's yeah. really cool. I, uh, yeah, I don't know if I would have cared that much. Like I, I, I like just the monochromatic clothing line idea, like where you don't have to consider what matches with things. No, you know, another event, I wonder who invented patterns. I wonder if mm-hmm. that would be a good episode. Mm-hmm. You're supposed to keep that to yourself, by the way. Yeah. I'm so that I'm surprised when we get into the uh, when we get into it. No, that's true. So the natural dyes, a couple issues with the natural dyes. One being again the owner's process in which they're you know created, which described, and natural resource issues. Uh, the other thing is that they just didn't last very long, so oh. they faded very quickly. These natural dyes. Um, hmm. In fact, they describe it as like once you washed the clothing, um, you know, again, they, they didn't have tied for colors. I think it was primarily just like banging a shirt against the rocks. Yeah. And so you literally were pounding the color out of the, of the clothing. Um, also, but, you know, I imagine with some of those royal vestments, it's not like they're getting washed all the time. You know what I mean? Like they're probably kind of smelly old things that are just really heavy. And, you know, that's just part of the deal. And they probably have backups, right? Like, you know, that starts to fade. You bring out another one. 
Um, yeah, but the sun point. was also, uh, you know, a factor because the, the the sun faded the colors. Um, so yeah, like again, England, you know, you know, it's not like you're in Barbados. You know, you're in England. No. Like the, yeah. you, you know, yeah, you definitely are in England. Definitely. You're in a drafty castle, so it's right. like okay, the purple's going to stay for a while. It it will, yeah, it's dark and damp. Um, it, so for a lay person, though, obviously, you know, colored fabrics, not so much happening. Um, it sort of reminds me of that Henry Ford thing, like a customer can have a car painted in any color in any color as long as it's black. You sort of like you don't have many choices in your wardrobe. But again, you're never going to have your socks. Don't That's match another because- one. Like who was the very first person who was like, you know what? This is silly. Why? Why are all the cars black? You right. Know? Right. Like, wait, yeah, like I'm just going to paint mine, you know, red. It wasn't just the cost of making this purple color from the natural dyes um, that is important to note. Uh, it's also, as you referenced in relation to the royals, the significance of purple. Right. Yeah. He didn't just create some shade of brown where it's like, oh, that's nice. Yeah. That's dog poop brown. That's dog poop brown. So the, it was very fortuitous that the color that he happened upon was purple. And so let's quick aside did he, on. Did he instantly say like, oh, whoa, that's kind of cool. Well, he did understand the significance of purple, which yeah. I find kind of interesting. Yeah. Quickly related to purple. So how and do you think this professor, like he gives the assignment and then part of the deal is like, okay, whenever they come up with something, he owns half the uh, patent. Wow. Amazing that you bring that up because I actually did look into that. I was like, well, yeah. wait a second. If he was doing I this as a school hard. assignment. Yeah. No, what he ended up doing when he first realized that something else was going on, he started doing his tests in a different part of his house or something that wasn't where he was doing his schoolwork. And so he claimed that what he was uh, creating had nothing to do with the assignment on quinine. But that did come up. Yeah, Yeah, but clearly it did. That's what it originated from. Right. Now we know that. But back then they're probably at the time he's like, I'm not letting Professor Hoffman horn in on the on the big money here. No, but Hoffman actually did ultimately try oh. to get in on it. Well, just on his own, on his own, on his own. Not even like trying to, to horn in on, on William, but just doing his own dye uh, activity. Yeah. But so a brief history of purple, which I found to be interesting. I was like, why is so so random? Um, and I looked it up and it, according to the New Testament, um, Jesus Christ, uh, you might be familiar with him, uh, in the hours leading up to his crucifixion was apparently dressed in purple. Oh, and- as sort of like a... Um- Whatchamacallit, like as sort of uh, teasing him or mocking him or something? That's exactly right. They were mo- yeah. The Romans were mocking him because he claimed to be king of the Jews. Yeah. So they're like, all right, king, let's put I on your purple. King. Throw on some purple. I wonder how they were making the purple back then. Was it from the shellfish over there in it the was. Mediterranean? Yeah. Huh. And, and, and in fact, I'm going to give you another little uh, tidbit about that. Um, Alexander the Great who seems to make an appearance in almost every episode of any season of our pods. Yeah. Um, someday I want to go through the list of like, which people popped up the most in our, uh, across multiple, like, uh, but anyway, Alexander. Yeah. You just asked Charlotte. Yeah, yeah. Just ping Charlotte. She'll know. Um, but Alexander the Great, when he was giving um, imperial audiences, wore purple. Uh, here again, another time, the, the kings of Ptolemaic Egypt all wore what was called Tyrian purple. Very cool. That goes back to your episode on Cleopatra. Yeah, exactly. Where you explain to us about Ptolemy and Ptolemy and all the different ones. Yeah, lots of Ptolemies back then. Yeah. Um, now, as early as the 15th century, and they and they were wearing purple, huh? Yeah, all they wearing loved purple. The purple. Yeah. It was this uh, Tyrian purple they called it. Okay, I wonder what. Now, the, what early, that, is that like a? Okay, I'll look. It's it up. a deep shade of purple. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, but as in early, Egypt, you do have the sun damage issue because like that is you know. Unless you're just hanging out, you know, in the pyramids, it's probably dark because I don't ever see any windows on the pyramids. So that it must have been dark in there. Yeah. Design flaw or was that just part of it? You know, like. Yeah. No, interesting no question. Windows. Yeah. So as early as the 15th century BC, uh, two cities on the coast of ancient Phoenicia, which is now Lebanon, uh, a city called Sedan and Tyre, uh, were producing purple dye. That's where a lot of this was coming from. And again, they were getting it from a snail. um, And Mm. the dye was actually mentioned both in the Iliad of Homer and the Aeneid. Yes, and the Aeneid. And this deep, rich uh, purple dye um, from the snail, the reason it became known as uh, Tyrian was because of that region in Tyre. So it was like, right. 
to your um, yeah, I, yeah. There's something about um, there's some theory that like I forget how it goes, but it's something to the effect of like you know when you don't have the word for the color, you don't see the color, and uh-huh. they like they they look back at um, I forget if whether it's the Iliad or the Odyssey, and they point out like there's just you don't see a mention of the blue sky or the you know whatever else a green tur- or whatever because and they're saying like those i don't know what the it, it's it's worth looking Why? into but the point is that that like they don't have the word for it yet and they're not um anyway i thought of it because you just you mentioned uh which one the iliad yeah the other thing that's just coming to mind is it has to do with with uh India. Like I, I associate them with weren't they did they have some way to make purple over there? Like Yeah, I, I mean the there the, there were places in which purple was being produced, but again, from these natural uh yeah. dyes, it, it still gotcha. involved using these various animals. So that was like the expensive, like that's the yeah. Okay. Super Very expensive. Rare. You know, you you asked about the uh, number of snails. So thousands of tiny snails had to be found. Uh, oh. Then they had to crack their shells, remove the snail. Um, and they have found mountains of empty shells in these ancient sites of Sedan and, and Tyr, where they Incredible. were producing this color. Yeah. Um, so these snails, they had to be soaked for a long time. Then their tiny glands had to be removed and the juice oh, extracted. Lord. I mean, it was a whole process. It took a long time. It doesn't sound cozy for the snail. Do they also eat the snail, by the way, or am I getting off track? You're definitely off track. Like I didn't <laughs> I didn't look into that. Uh, that'll be on, on killer restaurants. We'll, we'll get into that. Um, but, you know, a very owner's process to produce this. Um, and yeah. so that they would get this this dark purple dye and then they would use it uh, to dye the wool or the linen and silk it was a very bright color um but created at great expense um i bet bet cleopatra was was arrayed in some of that when she was presenting herself to uh mark antony or to julius caesar definitely some purple hitting the purple hard yeah no doubt um coincidentally uh a german chemist named paul friedander uh tried to recreate this uh, Tyrian, Tyrian purple in 2008. Oh. And check this out. He took 12,000 mollusks and he was able from those 12,000 mollusks to create 1.4 ounces of the dye, which was just enough to color a handkerchief. <laughs> so, I mean, can you imagine? I know those poor 12,000 mollusks, you know, just for like a tiny amount of purple Tiny dye. amount. Now that tiny amount, oh. a gram of Tyrian purple um, yeah. That was made from 10,000 Moloch's, um, according to the original formula, would cost about 2,000 euros in the year 2000. So super expensive. Well, and way back when, I mean, uh, in, you know, adjusting for all the uh, inflation and everything. But way back yeah. then, I would assume that that would also be a way to get rich. Like if you had a, if you were good at that process yes. and you had a team of people that would gather up, you could become a pretty wealthy dye uh, maker, dye seller. Yeah, that could be. I wonder if there was like a, a big business uh, around, around that. That, that, that. That's interesting. Got to be. I mean, you know, like with the Armenian um, carpets, with the Persian yeah. rugs and all that. Beautiful like, rugs. Incredible yeah. colors. And they were working with dyes way back when. But they must have all been, you know, from like natural say, dyes. from organic. Yeah, natural dyes. Yeah. But, so even... Um, great sophistication about you know working with different colors and stuff incredible yeah so those those are incredible so during the 60s and 70s in the u.s the counterculture psychedelics again another tie-in uh um and musicians like Jimi hendrix with his song purple haze um were all sort of centered on the color purple good point i you had that english rock band deep purple Okay, yeah. formed in 1968. So I wonder and then, what the yeah. association is there. Because, like, of course, the thing that popped into my mind was monarchy. But you're right. In the um, yeah, in the psychedelic uh, yeah. age, purple was a big thing. Yeah, I think it just took on this sort of aura of, like, you know, it started off being incredibly difficult to get and very expensive. So it had all those connotations of wealth and, you know, whatever. And then it just sort of morphed from there to become this coveted color. You know, even hmm. Prince, Purple Rain, you know, so purple just keeps coming up. Let's just leave it at that. So let's yeah. go back to the mid 1800s. Um, okay. And again, let's go back. at that time, purple just happened to be the most coveted color in all of Europe. Okay. Various shades of purple, pink, lilac, mauve, rose. Uh, that was the height of fashion. In the and, an eight, and an 18 year old accidentally makes it on spring break. I can't make this up. Yeah. So, so pretty incredible timing. Um, wow. 
Now, and it was her, only when he washed off the black goo that yes. the purple was left behind. Okay. Revealed itself. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. I mean, just unbelievable. So Perkin was not an idiot. He realized very quickly that he was onto something, you know, given the color. And so he filed a patent, filed a patent uh, in August of 1856. Oh, that year as an 18 year old, he does. It I think it was that day. I think he was yeah. like, Jesus, this is purple. Are you kidding me? I made it out yeah. of this sludge. We probably didn't even have to fill out all the paperwork. It's just like stain the piece of paper with the purple. It's like, dude, I know how to make this. Hit me up. Yeah, you don't need Latimer. Like you just, you know, <laughs> go ahead and just send in a swatch. You know, right. here's the invention or whatever. Um, good luck, you know, doing that without all the snails. Good so, use of swatch, by the way. Okay, go thank ahead. you. Yeah, I, I actually, that just popped down, and I, I was very pleased with that. Um, so now he files this patent, and he and 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 with the filing of the patent, they say, boom, a new industry was born. No, um, that's well because of these this this dye. But it's just purple. It's not like he's figured out some way to make all the other colors yet. Not yet. And that's another good, uh, you know, preview of what's coming. But he does call this purple, originally he calls it uh, Tyrion purple, uh, so that he felt it could have more value because that's the association with Tyrion is is where the value is. Um, And again, he could not have chosen a better time or place for his discovery. Yeah. England at the time, cradle of the Industrial Revolution. Right. Mm-hmm. Largely driven by advances in the production of textiles. So oh, I think boy. textiles, now you got to have the color. So the science of chemistry had advanced to a point where it could actually impact these industrial processes. And you have coal tar, which was the major source of, of this raw material that he was using, you know, from the, from the, the waste products, you know, in abundant supply for making this. Amazing. Now, hold on. So first he calls it Tyrion purple. He calls it Tyrion Purple when he files the patent. And, mm-hmm. and again, everything is basically in place for him to just exploit this discovery. You know, it, it, he's all ready to go with this Tyrion Purple. And again, he's 18. Notice um, he didn't call it Perkin Purple, which, well, you know. Some people did actually call it Perkin okay. Purple. Um, but before we get into what happened after he files the patent and essentially starts this new industry, uh, we need to hear from our new sponsor. Uh, which yes. I don't know if you heard in the open, um, is also quite appropriate for this episode. Um, oh, good point. Thank you. We're, um, we're so really like, chemistry heavy kicking off the inventions season. This is great. I was not a strong, I was not a strong chemistry student. I don't know about I don't want to boast, really, but I, I was a very strong chemistry student. Really? That yeah. sounded like boasting. I was very, I know it does when I say it that way, when I say I was top of my class in chemistry and helped everybody, um, don't want to brag, but wow, I was really good at chemistry. In fact, my chemistry teacher, you know, asked me if I would be continuing my studies in college in, uh, of chemistry. No. Yeah. Yeah. I, no I loved uh, science teacher ever inquired of that uh, to me. <laughs> Uh, they were like, they, they said, you know, it'd probably be better if the, you call it a day after this course. <laughs> Have you, you considered know? an alternative to science kit? Uh, <laughs> perhaps you're a man of letters. Um, okay. So now before we continue, let's hear from our new sponsor. And then I'm going to tell you what happens to the good William uh, Perkin on the other side. Perfect. During the COVID pandemic, we all saw the effects of global supply chain disruptions. One company stood out for its continued performance and supply, Jade Petrochemicals, with offices in Long Beach and Bahrain, with hiring preferences for military veterans. Jade Petrochemicals sets the global standard for safe storage and shipping of vital petrochemicals. Yeah, Jade Petrochemicals. They're welcome aboard. Yeah, super excited. And we're excited to be in partnership. Now, I have a question for you. Um, Probably won't be able to answer, but let me see. Yeah, that's the best kind of question because um, then you're flummoxed and then like <laughs> hilarity <laughs> ensues. No, for sure. Um, I would imagine there would be some people that might be bummed about affordable, prevalent purple. Like, wouldn't the monarchy be you know, like, hold on, hold on. 
Like that's our I color. I think it was just colorblind people were upset because they <laughs> felt like someone else had an advantage over them. You know? Well, but I thought colorblind people, it's trouble with green and red, isn't it? Well, red green is one type of colorblindness. Of, oh, oh, man. Of, which I do have. Yeah. You um, have a tremendous amount of useless knowledge stored in your head. I do. It's really frustrating. I feel like it takes up too much space. You know how you clear out your, your hard drive? Sometimes I feel like, can I clear out all this extraneous information? Because I, I hate when I just come up with random facts that I do not need to know. I was watching a hockey game the other day and I had to no watch way. the... You were watching <laughs> hockey? You've got to be kidding me. I had to watch the opponent's feed because it was against a local team here oh, in California. I hate that. Okay. But... You know, the, the, the opponent's broadcast team was like, hey, you know, by the way, Washington Capital forward, uh, Anthony Mantha, colorblind. And I was like, why did I, how, first of all, how did I not know that? Second of all, <laughs> what relevance does it have? Third, <laughs> why did I have to wait and find out about it from like the opponent's broadcast team? Like, but you could have, you should have had the second question first and just stopped there, <laughs> you know, with what relevance, uh, zero. So now I don't you have to can, consider this anymore. You can edit all of this out. Okay. But anyway, right. um, okay. so the monarchy, there's no evidence they try to crack down on the, no. um, no, okay. no, not, not again, limited research here. Cause it's Focus. like if purple is part of what was so special about it was that it was so rare, but so suddenly if everybody can have it. Yeah. And I think I read something around like the Pope and they were wearing purple, but then something changed and they switched to red. So I'm not sure like what, what was going on there. I Did don't you think see that had... the Pope just kicked that guy out of his house at the Vatican? Or are you up no. on that? And now he's yeah, evicting some... people? <clears throat> yeah, think, he evicted... think he'd have people to do that for him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he shows up. Did... Yeah, in the in the cape and everything. <laughs> no, this was like some American cardinal or something who was just he was one of the traditionalists. He was bummed about the uh, the new pope being friendly towards gays and all that stuff. And so he's just always harping away at this pope. And finally the pope was like, You know what, dude? Like you've been living rent free here yeah, at the no Vatican. Free lunch. Yeah. yeah. Go find lodging somewhere else. Start paying yeah. rent. Yeah. You don't like my ideas? You don't like my house. So get out Put of here. <laughs> Perfect. Um, okay, so now that's a good segue into what Mr. Perkin was up to after his invention. Uh, counting the money, I'm guessing. You're not far off. So yeah. again, he originally has this purple, this Tyrian purple, um, as it was known in the ancient world. Uh, so mm -hmm. then he, he decides to change the name to a more fashionable French word, mauve. Um, and Whoa. So yeah. that's the shade we're talking about? That is the shade we're talking about. Hmm. And the color mauve uh, was all the rage in the mid-1850s. So Lee Blazek, who wrote the book I mentioned, The Color Revolution, uh, she says, quote, the color mauve was all the rage in the mid-1850s as ladies of fashion adopted the new hues to come from the French and Swiss textile mills. Now, wait, this uh, this is the lady in Leeds? This is the yes. lady that wrote the book? Professor in Leeds. Yep. The Color Revolution. Yeah, like for instance, calling it like Leeds purple, like that wouldn't have been good. But if you put no. a French, you know, you put a French word on there, then it makes it fashionable. Yes. Yeah. And, and so when he went to start to commercialize this dye, this color, mm -hmm. uh, he changed it a little bit and called it uh, Mauvienne. So he took mauve and then he created Mauvienne. Yeah, I think that is now we're gilding the lily a little bit. Like just call yeah. it mauve and. Um, you I've, never even known, I've never even known how to pronounce that color. So I checked a couple sources. I went with mauve. I could be off. Yeah, know. I'm um, okay. Mauvian, like um, I A N at the end. Mauvian. Yeah, it was or, actually E N E, but it, it, it's it's yeah, M A U V E N. Okay, Mauvian. Yes, yeah, it's great like, like, like I thank you very much. That that was one of the teachers that said maybe you should keep studying this one. Really? Um, she said I had a good ear. Yeah, but yeah, good. Uh, and mauve was associated with, you know, Parisian haute couture, as they say. So, so he was trying to, I mean, again, very sharp for an 18 year old to not only capitalize on the dye, made, but to know how to name it. Yeah. This guy's 18. What, do we know anything about his parents? Were his parents like rich, fancy, connected people? Like he, he seems like a very sophisticated 18 year old. If he's like, okay, well, we got to make it French, then it'll sell. Again, outside the scope of. Yeah. This Outside episode is his purview. parents. Maybe yeah. if this was killer biographies, I would have gone into his family. But I'm, mm -hmm. I'm keeping this real. You know. Yeah. Um, Thank you for doing so that. So 
<laughs> this in a, in uh, August of eighteen fifty nine, um, in the newspaper there was an article where it said London had succumbed to what is known as the mauve measles. Everyone just wanted this mauve color. Amazing. And he just invented it essentially. Um, in fact, there's a great Holy photo God. online of the, the they still have the uh, little uh, glass vial and stopper with the label Mauvien, uh, the first one, the very first one that he oh, created. Oh, man. Which is very cool. And so uh, at the time, there was a lot of celebration around his discovery. And later on, someone wrote, uh, the, the the chemist uh, C.J.T. Cronshaw told a gathering of the Society of Chemical Industry, if a fairy godmother had given Perkin the chance of choosing the precise moment for his discovery, he could not have selected a more appropriate or more auspicious time. I mean, yeah, because of what you said. Well, yeah, because of what you said, the Industrial Revolution, they're starting to crank out the textiles. And everyone wants that color. Like he happened to discover that color first. You know, like that's crazy. That feels like it was meant to be. Um, yeah, and it keeps it keeps building on it because Queen Victoria um, was wearing this Mauvienne color, um, so that got more people, you know, demanding this color. Empress Eugenie, the wife of Napoleon the Third in France, sure. yeah, big fan of the mauve. Loved the mauve, huh? She was all about the mauve. And then with the you know production of the different textiles and uh, the hooped skirt required a large quantity of cloth. So it, all, all, all this came together and, and became sort of the perfect storm for Perkin. What a bizarre fashion innovation or technology that was. The hooped skirt. What the hell? The hooped skirt. Yeah. But well, that could be another invention. We didn't yeah. Cover. That might be a short episode. But in 1857, in May, one of his business associates in the textile industry wrote to him with congratulations that, quote, a rage for your color has set in among that all-powerful class of the community, the ladies. So very popular oh, with all of the dresses. And, and again, you had Empress Eugenie. You had all these people in highfalutin roles, uh, you know, showcasing this color. Wow. Okay. So all of a sudden it was the purple it was the mauve revolution in London in the it late was crazy. 1950s. Huh. Yeah, and in France, right? Because you how had you to, like uh, you know, walking around Paris or London and you're like, Yeah, I did that. I'm nineteen uh, now and I did that. No one would believe you. Um yeah. and it was also the very first time that sort of people, normal people like school teachers, could afford to buy these fabrics in these beautiful bright colors i mean i wouldn't just classify all school teachers as normal people but you know not all yeah sorry i didn't mean to, to make that a declarative but yeah what i will say is that again when you look at the serendipity the singer sewing machine had just started being imported from america so you have these people making their own clothes but now able to you know use this these colored fabrics Unbelievable. And they won't fade or, you know, when you wash them or, or dry them in the sun. You know, you know who's uh, the second happiest about this b beside Perkin? Who? The snails. Oh, my gosh. You are so right. Although oh. I did also read that among the very wealthy and potentially the royals, although I can't confirm that, they preferred the natural dye. Huh. Because that was what was still separating them from it was the just mass. like yeah, it was like a status symbol. I wonder if you could tell, like it, honestly, you know, if you had two fabrics and you put the two dyes next to each other, if you could really tell. Yeah, I don't know. That's a great question. the The color, which you know you'll see online, it is phenomenal. Like it is a, an incredible mm -hmm. shade of purple. Not usually that impressed with purple, but that that it looks really great. Again, you have the Mauvienne, um, and he went on to then discover some other colors. So he kept now producing colors. Factories started popping up across Europe producing these dyes. His professor, as I mentioned, took the bait. Like he started trying to create dyes as well. That's from not the taking the bait. Like I said, that's no. morning in. I mean, they, yeah. you know, it's like the student came up with it, dude. Right. Okay. But he didn't sue him. He just, you know, he, 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 he at first actually was very critical you, you mentioned the bad grade. He was very critical that Perkin uh, abandoned the quinine research um, <laughs> and, and pursued this commercial manufacture of artificial dyes. But then later he synthesized his own dye called Rosanullian or whatever. So, you know, he's trying to get in on the party. He, he gave him a gentleman's C. 
He's like, yeah, yeah exactly. didn't stick with it long enough. All right. So now Perkins, as I mentioned, he created something that was entirely new, incredibly desirable, um, but had done it through chemistry. And at yeah. the time, chemistry was not seen as a money-making endeavor. Hmm. And there's a plaque outside of his London home today that actually that says he, quote, founded science-based industry. So again, the repercussions of this invention was not just that he came up with purple, but created an industry and then it just manifested into all these other things, which I'll talk about. Yeah, maybe chemistry was more, you know, for medicine or research yeah. or whatever. But so the idea of like consumer products coming out of it was still new. Still new. Now, the mauve mania didn't last forever. Uh, yeah. By 1870, other colors came in vogue. So yeah. it wasn't all this mauve Um, But the effects of his discovery were everlasting. And Lee Blazek in The Color Revolution writes, quote, by laying the foundation for the synthetic organic chemicals industry, Perkin helped to revolutionize the world of fashion. Crazy. Yeah. Yeah. You know, with the other thing, just to tie back to last week's episode, when, um, when we were talking about psychedelics and psychedelics, how they've been used for thousands of years, that was, I forget where I heard this, but they mentioned that part of what was so stunning to people in these ancient colors about psychedelics is that they were having visions of these incredible colors, which were sort of rare in the natural world. Like, you know, the right. natural world is a little more drab. Interesting. So they, they, your brain created these colors? Yeah. These really intense co colors and like visions of, of like incredible jewels and sort of heavenly landscapes and stuff like that. But part of what made the vision so stunning to people is that, you know, these dyes hadn't been invented or popularized or whatever. So like in the natural world, they weren't seeing such intense hues, you know? Right. But interesting that you can see these vivid colors in your in your mind's eye, but they don't exist in reality. Like that yeah. that is interesting. What about um? Wait, so uh, not to not to be too materialistic about this, but does he get just obscenely wealthy? He does. So he's very young and very rich. And while yeah. he was sort of perfecting his technology, um, he created other colors. So you know his business was huge. And again, he basically inaugurated this new branch of chemistry, which hmm. would have, again, a huge impact in numerous fields. So again, going back to Lee, and you can see which book I leaned on here, but in The Color Revolution, she says, quote, that industry not only brought new paints, pigments, and dyes into the world, but it was ultimately responsible for major innovations such as synthetic rubber, fibers such as nylon and polyester, and miracle drugs such as penicillin. So wow. again, it's just this idea that chemistry could um, generate industry, you know, just yeah, generate wild. industry and generate billions in, yeah. in profits. So huge. And, and again, like the, no one ever considered like some simple experiment in this 18 year old uh, house would be a catalyst for this entirely new way that science and industry work together. I mean, it really was like, huge deal back then. Yeah, this was the perfect sponsor to have today, Petrochemicals. Yeah. Unbelievable. And she also compares him, frankly, to Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, and Bezos. She says, quote, all these entrepreneurs stumbled across an idea when they were young and unrestrained by the traditions that held back their elders and were able to create something brand new and revolutionary. Wow. I mean, that's heady company, right? Like, yeah. that's incredible. 18 years in old. Incredible. Uh, another huh. tie in. So he ends up dying in 1907. Okay. Again, a let very wealthy the, man. Let me do the math here. Yeah, so actually, he that'd be good if you could do that math. 70. Was he, geez, was he just 69? Yeah, he wasn't very old. Oh. Yeah, no, he had pneumonia, but he had a burst appendix, which um, uh, complicated a lot of things. Uh, he yeah. did have several children. Uh, he had four sons, all became chemists. Really? Yeah, that's cool. Which is interesting. So many honors in his lifetime. Uh, he was well, actually knighted. One of them is he was knighted. Yeah, you said he, he was, was knighted. Sir. sir, in 1906, he was knighted. Uh, mm -hmm. In the same year, he was awarded the very first Perkin Medal, appropriately named. And it was established to commemorate the 50th anniversary of his discovery of Movien. Today, the Perkin Medal is widely acknowledged as the highest honor in, in U.S. industrial chemistry. Uh, it's been awarded annually by the American section of the Society of Chemical Industry. 
Uh, of which he was actually president. He was president of the Society of Chemical Industry from 1884 to 85. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. So he really was a giant in chemistry. The Perkin Medal. The Perkin Medal. And then on top of that... Um, Do you 12th, feel like you could have you could have been a candidate, you know, if things had broke a different way for a, a Perkin Medal at one point? You know, I do often reflect on the flubber that I created, um, mm. and I, I realize no, like I don't think I actually had any innate ability in chemistry. I think I probably just studied. Your a little teacher bit disagreed. Yeah, Your teacher he really disagreed. did, Mr. Marsh. He really yeah. thought I had a future in chemistry. No, now, now on it, March twelfth, two thousand eighteen, not okay. that long ago, uh, right. Google. They had what they call a Google Doodle uh, to mark Perkins' 180th birthday. Okay, so Google does their Google Doodle, and and what is it? it it's like a purple scripted thing tribute to Perkins nice. uh, to, to Perkin, yeah, to his his nice. 180th birthday. So a lot of people must have known about this guy. When uh, he got knighted, do you think the um, the was monarch purple? was so, no? Do you think the monarch was like, yeah, but we're we're wearing the real shit here, dude. We're, <laughs> right. the, we're still using the snail stuff. Yeah, a lot like, of snails you know, went into good this. Good job. Thing. You can be a sir, but like. You know, this right. is what the real purple looks like. You want to see vibrant purple? Okay. <laughs> You're going to have to butcher some butcher some snails. Um, <laughs> you so, want to see vibrant purple? That's fine. But just step out of, step away from the window because it's very <laughs> susceptible to sun damage. So <laughs> exactly. come over here and look at my robe. Wait, why is it gray? Oh, you walked here. It's sunny out. You can't do that. Oh, man. Um, no, I just think it's insane that he was so young, that he was on vacation that he's doing homework and he's, you know, he's trying to synthesize this quinine for his motherland so they could continue to conquer, you know, lands far away. Incredible tale. And um, as for continuity, in, as for continuity, it reminds me a little bit of Albert Hoffman with LSD, where it's like, that's not really what he was trying to do. You right. know, he was trying to come up with something for childbirth or some kind of medicine. And then he's like, oh, what the hell is this stuff? You know, what? Same thing here. You know, it's like he's working away from trying to make some um, synthetic quinine. And it's like, oh, how about make a billion dollars instead by coming? Yeah, up I wonder if dime. like he had other homework on vacation. And he was like, you know what? I'm not even going to do it because I just invented purple. Plus, and so I'm going to leave that other homework. break. Aside. It's yeah. England. Do you think he was half Easter, in the bag yeah. while he was doing this work? He was just like, hammered. I don't know. What's the drinking age back then? Like, you know, he was only 18. He's got a home lab. I bet he's got yeah. like a distillery. He's mixing he's things like, up. He's yeah. mixing things up. He's like, the mom comes in. She's like, oh my God, you stained the napkins. Like, what? Right. His dad probably in there like, wait, did you just say you created mead? I'm thirsty. No, I said mauve. Like, what? What are you doing in there? What's with the sludge? Um, yeah. And why'd you ruin mom's car? I wonder. I wonder during the the uh, mauve measles, the mauve revolution. Yeah. I wonder if uh, men were also getting into it, wearing some purple suits and stuff, or is mainly more the female fashion. Yeah, only what I read was was really rooted in the the various female garments. So, uh, you know, all the dresses and the hats and the trimmings, uh, everything was in support of what the ladies, as they said, uh, were interested in. in it's work. interesting how there's connotations to color. You know, it's like we yeah. said, purple, monarchy, but then also like creativity, maybe, you know, with yes. Jimi Hendrix and the hippies and all that. Maybe it's that Alexander the Great's wearing the purple. Yeah. It's like, well, well that what, gets what to the that? monarchy. I mean, that gets yeah, to the more rulers, the, yeah, the, yeah, But then the there's rulers, also the creativity. Yeah. Whereas, like with red, you know, there are connotations to that, like, you know, seeing red or like the the um, bull in the matador or the sports right. car. Like, there's just different. Anyway, do we know what other um, colors he came up with? Any good ones? I didn't see anything that jumped out at me. Um, yeah. You know, it's I did- hard to top mauve. It's hard to talk about. I did, you know, obviously read way too much about uh, the way in which other colors were derived, like indigo. Um, you know, that came from the indigofera tinctoria um, made, uh, you know, the indigo dye from from what? the leaves of this plant. Yeah. Indigo. But is indigo like deep blue? What is yeah. indigo? Yeah, that's like a deep blue. That's cool. Um, but you had these insects that were very sought after because you could create like this scarlet dye called carmine. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you'd find these weird things like you kill a bug and you're like, oh, it's red. Uh, maybe I can, you know, wear a shirt. The other cool thing is it's not just the color. You know that they've got like the the blues and the purples or whatever, but it, they also had a lot of gold in Africa, and so they probably had like gold thread uh, and gold. You know, they had 
garments that had gold right. in them as well. Yeah, and it's interesting when you see some of the like hats back then and things like where they were using dye uh, very judiciously, so that it would be just on the trim or as a decorative item, not like a whole dress that's purple. You know, yeah, because you saw how many snails you feel. It kind of makes you feel like consumer culture and modern technology has sort of uh, ruined it a little bit, like because everything is just so widely available and so easy. To, you know, it's like okay, but you cool. still have designer labels. You know, people are still finding a way to essentially boast about their their place in society um, based on what they wear. Right. So it's the same idea. And it's weird how certain like why Burberry, like why that particular pattern suddenly like caught fire and became a status symbol. You know what I mean? Yeah, like inventions of patterns like that. I wonder about that. Like when was someone like, why isn't this shirt, you know, with a pattern? Like you should put a pattern on that shirt. Like, well, I don't and know. Then, I still just want a blue color. And then, like, some of them stand up and stand the test of time. And then there's other things, like the hoop skirts, where you just look back and you're like, what? A, what what were you world? thinking? Like, yeah. <laughs> what, who would ever think that the, the woman became more attractive because she had these huge hoop metal hoops underneath her? You know, well, and talk like about, weird... like, the amount of effort to produce a hooped skirt. Like, is it really worth it? Like, that just seems silly. Yeah, it sets off the the metal detectors. Um, just uh, just to proactively kind of anticipate a um, complaint from Lizzie. Not that uh, you know a woman's attractiveness is uh, you know the prime criteria or goal of fashion. No. So I just want you know fashion also is an expression of self. I've been taught yes. this by my uh, daughter. Yeah, yeah, that's and very true. Um, so it doesn't depend on the gaze of the man or whatever you know? correct okay so do, we, do you think i'm out of the woods there uh maybe i'm a little nervous but i was <laughs> quoting when i said uh the ladies like the, someone made a reference that your your color is the rage with all the important people meaning the ladies that's a quote i didn't make that up so i don't want to hear from that's also that. a good clarification okay good yeah yeah um so anyways that's this week's invention the invention of, of die it's, it's that, really that interesting. an amazing story that Great episode. Great episode. Does it, do we have to stick with chemistry for? Because I'm going to tease next uh, episode. Yeah, I was going to say, are you teasing? I'm teasing. Okay. And it, it's not chemistry. Okay. And it's something that has a, a, a connection to your family. That's all, oh. that's all I'm going to say. Okay. Now I'm nervous. Yeah. No, I'm don't nervous. be nervous. It's nothing that okay. will, uh, it will, it won't reveal any personal details or anything like that. Okay. And it won't okay. uh, reflect badly on the, okay. Kel- on the Geller clan. Uh, Excellent. Overall. <laughs> I'm just saying you have a personal connection to this. Excellent. Um, okay. okay. But in a sense, we all do. Okay. Sir William Henry Perkin. Perkin, uh, the inventor of the synthetic dye industry, really, more more than just the color. So that'll do it for episode two of Killer Inventions, season three of the Killer Means Awesome podcast. We look forward to our next episode in which you will be presenting uh, an incredibly interesting invention that somehow relates to me as well as everybody else. Yeah, we'll see if it's incredibly interesting, but it should be passably interesting. I'll take it. See you next time. All right. 